God in a deeper way um, has been motivating you to uh, pursue him as your first love and ultimate love. And so I pray um, that you see fit um, that this message be shareable. So please share with your friends, family, those that you love, because we're going to be talking about our daily walk, how we walk before God. It's important for us to walk worthy. So there's going to be a heavy but important message that I think will be beneficial for all those who's watching right now. But for those who's watching on YouTube, I want to say thank you guys so much for watching online. We greatly appreciate you guys' support. All those who are listening on Google Play, Apple Podcasts, and SoundCloud. All you guys that are joining in all different uh, social portals, we want to say thank you. Um, if you feel free to navigate below, there's some of the links in the description box for you to better get to know us. But also, please comment both Facebook Live and on YouTube. Please comment below. Let me know what really stood out to you. What, what seed was planted in your heart that you're going to carry off into your life so that you will bear fruit. Uh, so with that being said, also pause the video now. Go to, um, there's a link in the description box for you to download today's worksheet. The worksheet these great men and women are going through are there for you so you can be able to get the exercise at the bottom. The points are points, but it's the exercise at the bottom that helps this message be carried on throughout your week. <clears throat> so in the meantime, press pause. Well, I'll be right here when you get back. In the meantime, turn to Ephesians 4, 1 through seven. Let's read. The Bible says, I therefore, Paul speaking, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Let's pray. Father, God, thank you so much for this passage, this text, so dense, the whole chapter four of Ephesians. For the next 12 weeks, Father God, as we navigate through Ephesians four, I pray, Father God, that we will see the beauty of maturity, the beauty of, of maturing ourselves, walking worthy daily. And Father God, we just want to count on the honor that you will join us. I pray, Father God, that, that all heaven is silent and tuning in as, as they look on the mystery of a flawed man speaking to flawed people, but all covered by the blood. And I thank you right now, Father God, that you will speak through me in a way so potent, so fervent, so precise, Father God, that it will do surges to all of us. And I thank you, Lord, that before the end of the night, of the night you will seal us up with a hope and a joy in you. I come against every demonic spirit, every principality, every witch, every warlock, every spell, every curse, every hex that may be coming against me. I come against any type of demonic influence. The word of God will be preached in a high level in a way that it will transform the lives of everyone watching, listening, and tuning in. With that being said, God, we count on honor. And I like I always say, if you're not here, God, I'm, tr I'm wasting their time. So, Father God, speak through me. In your son's name we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's topic for this evening is walking worthy. Like I said in the prayer, for the next 12 or so weeks, um, I have 11 or so messages that's, that, that came from my time with God through Ephesians 4. In this text, is 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 really rich with understanding why we all should be mature in Christ. So for those watching online, those in the room, if you want to utilize a hashtag um, that, that you can tweet, that you can Facebook, that you can Instagram or whatever, tonight's hashtag is walking worthy. Walking worthy. <clears throat> I have two premises, a question, and then we'll get right into our problem. Premise number one. Our maturity helps others to mature. Our level of maturity helps others to mature. Premise number two, everyone's walk is either pleasing or displeasing to God. <clears throat> premise one, premise two, for the full 12 weeks or so, however long God wants us to dig deep, is that number one, our maturity helps others to mature. And number two, everyone's walk no matter saved, unsaved, gay, straight, backsliding, or thinking holy, everyone's walk is either pleasing or displeasing to God. The question for the night is, how are you carrying yourself and where are you going? How are you carrying yourself publicly, privately, and where are you going? <clears throat> Let's go to work. The problem, 
Many believers or people in general are walking in a manner not molded by Christ. Many believers or just people in general are walking in a way, a manner not molded by Christ. They think their walk is pleasing, but it isn't. Many believers or people in general are walking in a manner not molded by Christ. They think their walk is pleasing, but it isn't. It's imperative for you and I to know how pleasing my walk is versus just thinking. I think it is. It's, a, it's imperative for each and every one of us to examine ourselves, to examine the way that we're walking, because many of us, we just coasting, but not really self-examining ourselves to see, God, am I walking in a pleasant way in every area of my life? Many believers are trapped in the fog of intellect where they believe that, oh, God is actually okay with my life. God loves us, but God doesn't love everything that we do. Because each and every one of us, like I have say many times, are under some level of deception that it's going to take years upon years, actually more than that, your entire life to discover just how dense this demonic deception is. That's why it is my objective to say, God, before I run to a place, let me see how I'm walking. How are you carrying yourself? Where exactly are you going? Many of us do not take the time to say how Am I walking before God? And where am I going? Some people are walking pleasing, but they're not going to a specific place. You got to take an account. God, am I going, <clears throat> excuse me, in the direction that you have for me to go? Many believers or people in general are walking in a manner not molded by Christ. They think their walk is pleasing, but it isn't. The calls. The cause of this problem is due to the acceptance of carnal molds and due to poor leadership slash manipulation of Christian leaders. The cause of this problem is due to the acceptance of carnal molds and due to poor leadership slash manipulation of Christian leaders. Many believers are being molded more by the influences of wolves than the influence of the shepherd. The cause of this problem is due to the acceptance, the acceptance, the, the <clears throat> ignorant acceptance of carnal molds, meaning I'm molding my life after carnal things and carnal people. This, 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 this current Christian scope, this current Christian um, 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 place is so carnal that new babes and new believers in Christ do not know exactly what's really true and what is really fake. It's so sad that many of us are walking in a way that's so contrary to how Christ wants us to walk that we have been deceived to such a degree that we're actually thinking that we're okay. We accept these carnal modes. We accept them. We accept them like Israel wanted a king. We accept them how people want something other than God. And God is saying, what, 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 what are you accepting? What are you adopting? What are you alienating? Not alienating. What are you accepting? What are you, what are you going after? That's important to him. Because whatever you accept will determine what you go after. So many of us are accepting. Like, like, that, like this should be such a debt to you and God that even the subtle deception is a disgrace. That when you even see a show that advertises a mold that we should not mimic, there should be a deep disgrace that I'm not gonna allow anything in this house that's gonna influence me to walk differently. That's why we have been so carnal. We have been so um, 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 structured into such a mold that we are okay with these influences, okay with this kind of music, okay with this kind of TV, okay with these kind of friends to the point that we're just a mold after them. Satan is a genius at what he does because he knows all I got to do is move you away from God and have you be molded by my culture. That's why. What kind of culture do you have in your home? 
What kind of culture do you have inside of you? What do you accept? What do you listen to? What do you watch? Who do you go after? Because if you truly love God, when you're in an environment of carnality, you won't even allow a dime of yours to be spent in a place where God ain't going to get the glory. My feet will not enter a place for luxury, for pleasure, if I know, because everything is capable of influencing you. Oh, no, no, I can listen to this song. It ain't going to influence me. I can listen to this. I can watch this. I can do this. I can play around with sin. It ain't. Listen, listen, the fact that you do it is the fact that you have been influenced by a carnal mode. How do you think? Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. How do you move? It's a reflection of the motives of your heart. And until you look inside, you won't be able to see outside and you won't be able to see what's coming after you. Carnal modes and due to poor leadership slash manipulation of Christian leaders. All leaders, all Christian leaders are not Christian. Social media has given us an open door. I look at social media more of a blessing than a curse to a degree because it gives me the opportunity to observe your fruit. It's so sad that we follow before we examine fruit. These people in their stories, they post who they listen to, they retweet who, who are living, they, they retweet people who are not living a life after God, they're, they're taking pictures with them. It's, it's crazy to me that the church, it finds it enticing, finds it gratifying that if I take a picture with someone in a secular world, if I take a picture with them, it validates me. When, when are we gonna get to a place where they come looking for us, not us going after them, to receive validation and so many Christian leaders are either persuaded, influenced, or they're actually wolves. Wolves do what wolves do. Wolves do what it takes to ensure that the people of God are deceived. Wolves got a job. Wolves have quotas. Wolves are under blackmail. Wolves are under disgrace. They're under something. That's why you got to be very careful that you don't accept everything with a Christian stamp, with a fish, with a cross. You better look at something and say, is this person bearing the fruit? Fruit, fruit. What are they bearing? The Bible says you won't know them by their messages. You won't know them by how many followers they have, you would know them by their fruit. We are more fanboys and fangirls than farmers examining the quality of fruit of people. And when you know <laughs> that God looks at fruit, he don't look at how tall the tree is. He don't care about how many branches. He says, is this tree alive or is it poison? What kind of tree? Bitter and sweet water cannot come through the same faucet. God's saying, wake up my people and examine the fruit. And don't just be a fruit hunter. You better be more consumed. Am I bearing fruit? <laughs> See, people get uh, nervous about believers judging. The Bible says that when you live a certain life, a righteous life, then you can have righteous judgment righteous judgment. You can't righteously judge someone if you don't have a righteous life. You can't have a righteous life until you accept the imputed righteousness of Jesus on your life. There's a, that's why when people say, don't judge me, no, no, no. My goal is not to judge you, but if we got a relationship and we're connected, I'm gonna let you know because I'm going to be held accountable. See, that's why I don't preach this, 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 this fun boy, this, this locker room sermons. I don't, I don't preach that stuff. You know what I preach? I preach on behalf of a God that's going to judge me based upon what I did in this position. That's why you got to make sure that you're not celebrating the obvious carnal. See, when you're removed and you're not in that world and you see how tight his pants are, and you see how she carries herself, and you hear, that's why, that's why, listen, what do you think the slaves did, this, what do you think the uh, masters did to slaves well, throughout history? We're not talking about African American, we're talking about slavery of all kind. They knew the Bible was true, but if you can't read it, oh, what's worse, can't read, or but can read and still be deceived. See, the slaves had excuses, they couldn't read. But what's even worse is that people know how to read, but don't read. And if you knew what the Bible said about how you should navigate this life, you would say, you know what? 
I'm not going to accept anything whose mold is not Christ. Man, all you got to do is for someone to have a pedestal and a platform and all they got to do is subtly suggest compromise. Oh, you taking pictures with this artist? That's a subtle suggestion. Oh, you listening to this on your story? You got 45 million followers? You subtly suggesting. See, see, people saying, you know, the Bible says, don't, if, if they don't eat pork, don't eat pork unless you cause your brothers to, to. But, but many of us just flood our carnality into our everyday public life, and we wondering why. When we stand before God, God's gonna be like, you didn't know that what you did here on this platform, on this day, led Susie, led Martha, led Jim, led Bobby astray. That's why the Bible says you better take heed and make sure that you walk worthy because there's a lot of people watching how you walk. Due to poor leadership slash manipulation of Christian leaders, wolves are not underground. Wolves are mainstream. Everything mainstream is not a person who was positioned there by God. People at the top only have two ways to get to the top. They only have two forces to get them to the top. Demonic force or divine force. Everyone at the top is not for God. It's funny how I listen to certain Christians and believers and and people who talk about their favorite pastor and favorite this and like preachers don't use manipulative techniques right now. Like, like preachers, why do you think the lights are always dim? Why do you think the lights flash? That's a part of, of, of manipulating, not manipulating, that's a part of, what's the word starts with H? Hypnotism. It's, it's a part of conditioning you. It's a part of getting you so consumed with the preacher that the preacher's voice is more paramount than God's voice. That's how they can control the masses. That's how they can keep you carnal because people who on fire with God will test the Authority. They were tested by the word of God. And if you and, and, and if you and if you're not carnal, you always put cash before them <laughs> because they have the control. But how many believers right now go to their pastor? They, they are easily swayed by the voice of a man. God wants us to examine fruit. I'm not sitting there saying everyone is imperfect, nor am I saying is everyone perfect. But what I am saying you better make sure they're perfectly placed because they're per perfectly placed in the presence of God. They will, they will bear fruit. Many believers are being molded more by the influences of wolves than the influence of the shepherd. Let's break down the scripture and get into the meat of what I want to talk about. The Bible reads, the first verse, first verse, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord. Paul right now is in prison in Rome. You can almost imagine the frustration, but the jubilance of a man who's in prison on behalf of what his savior, that even in prison, he's saying that even if you walk worthy, it may lead to this, it may lead to this, but he says, I'd rather be a prisoner here and be freed inside than to be free outside and a prison on the inside. This Paul looking with, out of a Roman jail cell is saying, I urge. Number one point one, urge. Urge means strongly suggest. Paul is saying, man, I strongly suggest that you walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Point number one, your level of urgency and awareness will determine your level of execution. <clears throat> your level of urgency and awareness will determine your level of execution. You have to execute to execute. Your level of urgency and awareness will determine your level of execution. You have to execute your flesh, execute your sin, kill it in order to execute. We don't live with awareness or urgency. Urgency. No soldier entangles themselves 
with civilian affairs for their main focus is to please the one that enlisted them. Calling means you have been enlisted. I chose you, I'm enlisting you. I chose you for a purpose, I'm asking you. I'm not even asking, I'm choosing you to be a part of my kingdom. And it's so sad that many of us as believers are not living with, in a state of urgency. I'm not sitting there saying you live like God's gonna come back tomorrow, but what if? People who live as if tomorrow is promised mismanage today. But those who live as if tomorrow's not promised manage today. People just think that I always got a tomorrow. But we don't know what holds or, who, or what tomorrow holds. Your mom might get cancer tomorrow. Your father may die tomorrow. You may lose a leg tomorrow. You may get a bunch of money tomorrow. Tomorrow holds things that today is begging you to prepare for. So many of us, we wait till a tomorrow, and then when that tomorrow becomes today, you mismanage it. When God is saying you got to live with a state of urgency where every minute counts, every second must have a purpose. Even your resting has a purpose. Even your 2K has a purpose. Even your meal prep has a purpose. Everything <coughs> is purposefully placed <coughs> with a purpose. Everything excuse me, must have a purpose to it. I don't know what holds tomorrow. I'm just glad I know who holds my tomorrow. Because when he holds my tomorrow, he is eventually <clears throat> going to position and prepare me today so that when tomorrow becomes my today, I will be able to manage it. Awareness, discernment is key. We should walk in a way where we say, you know what? Urgency doesn't mean I rush. Urges mean I'm specific. Urging doesn't mean, oh my gosh, I gotta rush, because when you rush, you make mistakes. Urging just says, my heart is aware, and my heart is earnestly and fervently going after, relentlessly, my assignment for today. Your level of urgency and awareness will determine your level of execution. It will determine what you do. <clears throat> when you know that the Father is coming, when you know that there's gonna come a day, when you know that the signs of the time are gonna be prevalent, when you know there's gonna be a great falling away, when you know that you know that you know that the Bible uh, um, tells us that these things are gonna happen, you're gonna say, God, I'm not going to waste time today. I'm going to be faithful and going after what I'm deeply aware of. You can't have discernment if you don't have fellowship. When you spend time with God, your discernment heightens. You can't expect to have full discernment with a partial walk with God. The first person you should be focused on walking with is God to ensure that as I walk with him, I adopt the character of him to the point to where now I can be able to sense things days away. I want a discernment that when I see a smile, I see the purpose of your intent. That when I see you and I feel you, that's why I say, God, increase my, my discernment so that when I walk into a room, I can feel the temperature of the room. I know that there's more in this room than outside. That's why we got to get to a place where we say, God, make sure that I discern like you. The Bible says that Jesus did not entrust himself with people because he knew the heart of the people. He was around people, but he did entrust himself with people. He said, you know what? I know your hearts. Even Peter, bro, I know your heart. Judas, I, he, he said, I chose Judas with Judas intent already known, but without a Judas, there wouldn't have been no Calvary. But you got to have a discernment where you're able to say, God, I see why my enemy's close right now. <laughs> I see why you place it. You feel it so that when the time comes, you'll be like, my betrayer is drawing nigh. He had a discernment where he was able to sense the time of his Jerusalem. He had discernment to be silent for 30 years. He had discernment from, from, the, from the baptism to the wilderness. He had discernment because he had to have it in order to live a perfect life. I'm not sitting there saying we're gonna have a perfect life, but what I am saying that we have a gift where we ask God, God, what all is in my life right now that I need to be aware of? Some of us are being led by blind people. 
and wondering why we're in ditch after ditch. We got to wake up. We got to wake up not from a carnal rest, but we got to wake up from our heart being at rest in who Jesus is and what he did. Because when you're at rest in him, when you rest it, you deserve better. <clears throat> People are woke, but they're not, they, they not resting in Christ, though. They're, they're woke through carnal means. They're woke through carnal understanding. And so they're trying to put these dots together without, the, without Jesus. But I tell you right now, it is such an amazing life being able to discern at a high level. You can't be easy to deceive if you have deep discernment. Your level of urgency and awareness will determine your level of execution. It will determine how far you go. It will determine what you do. You have to execute. You have to kill. You have to destroy anything that's going to hinder you from executing. Listen, God, listen, he is serious <clears throat> about the fruit that we bear in his life. He is serious about the return off his investment. He is serious about us fulfilling our purpose. I'm not sitting there saying that you're working, working, working for this love. But like I always say, you should be so in love for God that you wake up willing, willing available that listen listen who gets the first fruits of your life who, who gets the first seconds who get who, who gets the first breath who get like like God said man I kept your heart pumping while you were asleep and you want to check this you want to check that you want to have this resting on your heart he says man none of them can make you breathe I'm the one that gave you the breath of life we got to get to a place well we say God I am so in love with you that here I am, send me. Whatever you need for me to do, speak, Lord, your servant heareth. That's King James, heareth. <laughs> you know, you was raised, when you was raising them old churches, you, you, be, you, you King James, right? The heareth and thoueth and showeth. Anyway, many people are completely unaware of how serious life is. Paul said, man, I urge, man, urgency, man. I strongly suggest that you walk in a manner worthy. Many people are completely unaware of how serious life is. They wait until it's too late to take it seriously. <clears throat> your level of seriousness of your life will determine the specifics of your life. When you serious about your life, you move differently. See, <clears throat> I know who I am. Because I know who I am, I move like he sees I am, right? I move differently. Because I know, like, Josh, there's a lot of people who, who need your gift. <clears throat> there's a lot of people who, who appreciate what you do. You got to move different. I'm not even talking about sin. I'm just talking about looseness. I'm talking about looseness in money, looseness in relation. I'm talking about, you gotta, you gotta be tight. You gotta be tightened. You gotta tighten things because you know for a fact there's an adversary waiting for your slip up, waiting for you to get comfortable. That's why I love the story of Gideon. Gideon started off with how many people? 32,000? Was it more than 32,000? 32,000. <laughs> Quote me on it. <clears throat> Going up against the army of 130,000. And God said, man, getting you have too much with you. What do you mean? We got 32,000 members, God. <laughs> the church is healthy. <laughs> we are good. He said, no, no, no. You have too many with you. And what did God tell Gideon to do? He said, bring your man. He said, first, anyone who's scared, tell them to go home. It cut down all the way from 32,000. I forgot the number. I think it was 3,000 or so. Cut down. All the people went home. He brought the people to the water. He says, the men <clears throat> who dip their face in the water, tell them to go home. But those who bring the water to their face and keep watching, you keep them. God is always going to allow you to bring you to a place of a carnal refreshment to see what you do with it. 
He's going to bring you to the water to see what you do with it. Because he says, do not get comfortable and drink. You should be so conditioned that when you get to a refreshing place, when you get to a place of promotion, you still bring it to you while still watching. That's important. Because many people don't understand that one slip up can cost me my life. My life. Like, 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 I don't want the story of a preacher that died young. I don't want a story of a person that fell into and fell into temptations of, of emotional eating. I don't want to be that, Josh. I don't, I don't want to be that because I know for a fact them demons are just waiting, waiting for the drift. He just says, all I got to do is have you walk my way versus walking his way. Y'all all right? Many people wait until it's too late to take their lives seriously. Appreciate the support. You, you represent your whole self and to walk. He says, I urge you to walk. You represent your whole self. To walk represents how you carry yourself. Point number one, your walk equals you. Your walk is not talking about your limp. It ain't talking about your swag. It ain't talking about, is swag still in? No, yeah, it, whatever, whatever. It ain't talking about that. We're talking about who you are, how you carry yourself. My second question, number two, is what all makes up you? <clears throat> We're talking about all. God ain't trying, God ain't like, oh, I let that pass. No, he says, what all makes up you? We're talking good. We're talking bad and we're talking ugly. All of us got it. We, we got something in one of those categories. <laughs> we all got, I got some ugly too. <laughs> I don't care how pretty you are. I don't care how handsome you are. I don't care how, how big your portfolio is. I don't care. We all have an ugly. That's why we got to say, God, I'm going to look at me. I'm going to look inside of myself and I'm going to ask myself, what all makes up me in every area? The efficiency or the effectiveness of a company is predicated on their systems. Systems. Systems sustains. Systems sustain. Now, what does that mean? The right systems in my life covering the, the love category, the joy category, covering these different areas will ensure that I operate at a high level in those areas. A person with poor systems or no systems in an area will always have an area of vulnerability. That's why you got to say, okay, no, no, no. I can't let this sin pass too long. When you understand God said, I don't, I don't mind you stumbling. I mind you stumbling without intentionally setting up systems. He's saying you should be so disciplined because the root word of disciple is discipline. That in order to be a disciple of mine, you got to deny yourself. Take up your cross before you even think about following me. So he's saying what systems do you have in every area of your life? Systems to cover your good area. Systems to make your bad areas good. Systems to turn your ugly into fascinating. You got to say, you know what? What inside of me could cause my eventual downfall? If only David dealt with his lust, maybe he could have built the temple. If only certain people would have took care of an issue. That lust issue had him almost lose everything. I don't want to leave a little crumb in my life or a seed of carnality in my heart that can lead me into puffing myself up that when I get to a pinnacle of my life, that thing that I left undealt with destroys me. Each and every one of us have an area that's causing us to walk with the limp, walking lame, unable to execute at a high level. That's why the Bible says lay aside every weight that so easily besets you. Lay it aside. Everything that's keeping you from running fast. All throughout the whole NFL combine. They, they are not going to run their 40 with book bags full of bricks. They're not going to do that because they're trying to get a mark. That's why in order for me to leave a mark, a mark that lasts, a mark that is established, I got to lay aside any and everything that's going to cause me not to walk 
worthy. What all makes up you? Number three, what does a person's walk tell you about them? What does a person's walk tell you about them? Just by, just by observing, just watching. It tells you their level of confidence, their level of urgency, their level of ability, and their level of purity. What does a person walk tell you about them? It tells you their level of confidence. Either they're cowardly, confident, or cocky. Their level of urgency, it determines how serious they're going after what they're going after. It tells you their level of ability. If a person's in a wheelchair, obviously they're not able to do what a person with two strong legs would be able to do. And it tells you their level of purity. Purity means the paths that they take to satisfy their lust. Their level of confidence, not carnal confidence, but Christ confidence. A person who doesn't have confidence is a cowardly person. A person who is, think of themselves more highly than they ought to think, is a cocky person. God doesn't mind us confident, but confidence in Christ has a strong undertone of humility. Christ-like confidence is Christ's ultimate humility. That I know who I am, so much so that I still can take the least place in a place and still know who I am. That when someone says something outside of my name, if someone tries to destroy me, if someone tries to affect me, I know who I am, but I don't have to tell you who I am. There's a confidence that when we walk worthy of God, when we walk this thing with God, we don't walk cowardly or cocky or puffed up or put down. We walked pressed after the person to such a degree that people say that man, that woman is on a mission. Confidence. That when you walk into a situation, you don't have time to worry because you so wet of worship. The potency of worship is so grand that when you step into a place that used to be a place of worry for you, it doesn't wreck you. I want to get to a place of maturity where I can walk confidently in a storm and fall asleep on a boat like Jesus did. Why can't we rest in our storms anymore? When are we going to get to a place where we actually say, God, it's raining outside. A storm's coming. But I'm a rest. Because, Father, you said you will make it to the other side. Even if I'm going in the wrong direction, God, I still have a fish take me where I got to be. <laughs> no matter where you are. If you really love him and after his will, you will be in the right place full of confidence. It tells you the level of urgency. It ain't nothing, man, when it, it, it gets on my nerves when I get three calls on the walkie and a kid that I picked up who got in trouble the first time wants to kick rocks and walk slow. I'm like, bruh, I'm trying to get you to ISS so I can get to the next fire. But they wanna walk Take their time. I'd rather, I'd rather for God to chase me and reel me back than to try to pull me to where he is. Either way is wrong. You should be beside him. But I do not want to be in a place where God is like, we got somewhere to go. I got somewhere that I want you to be by now. Because if you get there by now, the people that you're supposed to reach will be reached. So many of us are now walking with a level of urgency. If this building was on fire, would you walk out? Would you just stroll out? You'll run out. So many of us are in certain sins walking casually out of them. If you knew that the sin is going to end up taking your life, you will act and walk with a level of urgency out of it. Oh, if you really want to be free from lust, if you really want to be free from pride, you will walk with urgency. If you really want to be, people don't want to be set free, y'all. <laughs> oh, oh, I want to be free who the sun sets free. I'm free indeed. Father God set me free. And God said, the cage has been open since I saved you.
If you truly wanted to be free. Oh, who was the two apostles in the prison? Who were they? Paul and Silas. When the gates was open and the shackles was brought down, they, they weren't just sitting up. They said, no, we're free. God has set you free 2,000 years ago. And when he pursues, he says, you're set free. Freedom is not being set free. Freedom is proven when you walk in that freedom. Meaning I'm walking in such a level of urgency that God, I've, I'm, I'm walking out of this sin because I see the sin for what it really is. Their level of ability. So many people are so obese that their weight of sin aches their knees to where they can't even walk efficiently. I want to be loose. I want to be agile. I want to be versatile. I, I want to be able to get up in the moment and not grab my chest. I want to be able to, to move and, 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 and do things. And, 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 and God is saying, man, you got to build yourself in the person I need you to be to fulfill my calling. That means you'll change your diet. It, may, it means you'll implement new disciplines. It will make sure that you put to death certain things. It will make sure you do whatever you gotta do to make sure that when your moment is called and when your name has been called, you're conditioned for it. Could it be that God has delayed what you were called to do because you're not conditioned yet? <clears throat> I helped out with the ORU basketball team, but I never played for them. I had to connect through my pastor to the dean of students where I could have made a team. I could have, I could have been a rest or I could have been a walk on. And I remember, and it, and it eats me to this day, I was on a practice team, I helped them out and stuff, but I didn't get a jersey. You know why I didn't get a jersey? I had the favor, but I, didn't, I wasn't faithful to the point of to receiving that favor. So what I was doing, I was a poor boy and I got three meals a day. <laughs> So instead of being strict on my diet, what did Coach Josh do? Oh, y'all got fries and burgers. Oh, pizza over there. Oh, rice stromboni over here. I don't need not, uh, stromboni, whatever. With, with all kind of food. I had unlimited breakfast, unlimited lunch. That when it was time to try for the team, who was out of shape? Me. But I had four months to prepare. And it aches me because that was a dream of mine. Not to be on a practice squad, not to help out with the team, but to put on a jersey. God to say, you know what? <clears throat> At least be on the injured reserve. <laughs> At least be on the IR. He says, so many of my people in the stands when I wanted them on the bench. And he says, I cannot put you in the game if you're not conditioned for it. That's why I want to have the ability to travel. I don't want to only get a fraction of my calling because I was only conditioned for that fraction. Not just, not just being strong physically, but we're talking about spiritual, emotional, mental disciplines that when pressed, I still walk worthy. That's the level of maturity we should be after that. Even when pressed, when the girls are after you, when the guys are after you, when the money's in front of you, when the opportunity is there and you hear the Holy Spirit say, no, you still walk worthy. It doesn't matter. Wrong is wrong, even if everybody is doing it. And right is right, even if no one's doing it. That's a principle that you should adopt. Daniel said, I don't care about who's not praying. I'm praying. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, I don't care if y'all all bow. We ain't bowing. You got to make sure you surround yourself with people who don't do what's wrong because everyone's doing it and chooses to do right even when no one is doing it. Because when you're doing things right when pressed, you will be protected. His grace is sufficient only if you will grind under that grace cloud, under that grace gem. I'm talking about, look, we got to work out our salvation with fear. We got to, we got to build ourselves up so that when he says, it's time for you to play. Oh, you're not sitting there looking. Mm -mm. Them people, what's his name? Um, for the play for Oklahoma football team was uh, uh, Baker Mayfield. Baker Mayfield was a walk on for two teams, wasn't it? And, and, and now he got the Heisman. Like, 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 like people, you, Sometimes you break opportunities or you make opportunities is your choice. 
your lifestyle will either break opportunities like, oh, that's not for you, or you'll be so focused that you will make your opportunities. And it tells you about their level of purity. Joseph was like, yo, man, you trying to press up on me? <laughs> you know, you looking at my, my non-Egyptian skin? <laughs> you know, my diet is different. Come on now, listen to me. My diet is different. The Hebrews didn't eat like the Egyptians. So, so he, Joseph probably had good skin. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That, that, that skin under the golden tent of the sun. That we're talking about Joseph. And he said, even though I have favor to be in Potiphar's house, I'm not going to mismanage my position. But let me take another step further. Go back and get your coat. Or make sure you got your coat zipped. So, so make sure your coat is on. Because you, anyway, let's keep going. Number four, who is watching your walk? There's four people watching your walk. I'm going to go through this real quick. Who is watching your walk? Others, I mean, sorry, God, others, the spirit realm, and it should be you. Who all is watching your walk? God, others, the spirit realm, and it should be you. The one that should put the fear in you is God is watching your walk. Whew. God, is every step that I'm taking pleasing? Because God, I know you're watching. It's so sad how we sin openly before a holy God, but withhold our sins from unholy people. We don't show our sins to people because we got a carnal name to hold. A carnal name to, we have, we are my name. I can't, I can't have you thinking that I'm, that I'm still this and I'm still that. No, 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 no. But God said, I know what you do when no one's watching. And that should put such a fear in you, a level of respect in you that you say, God, Promotion doesn't come from the east or from the west. It comes from you, God. I work unto you. When you work unto people, your level of excellence is not going to match a person who works unto the Lord. Because when you work unto the Lord, you are exceeding man's level of excellence. Oh, you ain't still in, uh, uh, <laughs> you're not still in the paper clips? <laughs> what? You asked for permission? Oh, you clock out, clock in on time. Like, you here early, you stay late. When you work into the Lord, you know promotion don't come from you, ma'am. Unfortunately, I don't work for you. You're working for me. He raised you up for honorable use because you hired me. <laughs> so he raised you up for honorable use. <laughs> so now, when you work into the Lord, you move differently. When you work unto man, you only do in front of man what you, what you should do in front of man, and then you do dirt when the man ain't watching. But when you work unto the Lord, you know he's always watching. So when you know, well, here's happening to me, the drink machine give you two orange juices <laughs> from 185 cent. <laughs> you leave the orange juice on top of the thing. <laughs> when you know, I mean, just little things, little things turn into big things. When, you, when you're undisciplined in a small area, you will be proven undisciplined when exposed. That's why when it comes to anything that I do at that job, I ask for permission because I ask so that when I do it, nobody can't say nothing. Listen, when you work as the Lord, you know God. Man, God be getting you too, man. God gonna be like, you man, when you work unto me, I'll make you do even what the boss don't even require you to do, which means I want you to talk to this coworker, which I means I want you to listen to this coworker, which I means I want you to give this person $10. Like, like when you work unto the Lord, you're working on behalf of him because you're supposed to be the one that creates the culture in your workplace. If you are not establishing a unique culture in your workplace, maybe your connection to God ain't strong. I'm not saying to say you change the culture as far as, because some people, we work in some bad cultures. I'm not saying that when you walk in, but what I'm saying, you should be so potent that when you walk into a certain demonic culture, there's a certain type of respect around you. 
Man, when I walk at the job, there's a, there's a unique reverence for me. Not because of who I am, because of who I carry inside of me. When you walk a certain way, people will see you're different. But if you laugh at every dirty joke and you cussing with them and you, and you, you just trying to blend in. <laughs> Jesus ate with sinners, where though? <laughs> where did he eat with these sinners? <laughs> In the, in the teacher lounge? Where did he eat with them? People think that Jesus was just wherever the sinners were known as sinners were seeking Jesus. Jesus was like, hey, we eating here. Well, can I eat with you? But so many of us would say, well, I'll just compromise so I won't ruffle any feathers. True change happens in other people's lives when change people reviews, refuses to compromise. Real change happens in other people when changed people refuse to come, refuse. How many people's lives was impacted when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out the furnace not smelling like smoke? How many people's lives were changed <clears throat> when Daniel walked out of that thing petting lions? God loves miracles when his people stand strong when tested. Miracles happen when you go to a limit of complete trust in him, anchored in complete obedience to him, you can't expect your marriage to be blessed if y'all was lustful in the beginning. You can't expect, the Bible says he would not hear the prayer of a man if he mistreats his wife. God said, if you dishonor what I see as honorable, your prayers won't even get past two feet above your head. And God's saying, we got to get to a place where we honor who sees all. I don't want to honor people more than I honor God. He says, why fear man who can only kill the body? He said, you better fear the one who could put body and soul in a hell. Oh, you don't got no hell to put me in. Why are you judging me? <laughs> I'd be laughing at these people. Only God can judge me. Do you know how scary that is? <clears throat> at least I know what you showed me. <laughs> That's all I know. <laughs> I, only see what, I only see what you showed me. Only God can judge. I laugh at how, <laughs> how naive and elementary that saying is. Well, let them judge you then. <laughs> oh, let's keep going. Others, others are watching means I got to walk differently because I know the babies are watching. Mr. Ezra can't be cussing folk out. Well, Mr. Ezra, you cuss somebody else. Why? Once you mess up in the area, <laughs> a weaker person then says, I see validation in why I should. Yeah. It sucks, man. <laughs> it really do sometimes. You, 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 before, before you say who you're called to be, don't say it until you're conditioned for who you're called to be. Well, I'm a preacher of the gospel. I preach. The girl in the front row said, but we slept with each other last night. Well, I preach the gospel, but wasn't you just? I don't want to be a stumbling block to anyone, which means in order for me to walk worthy, I got to put the work in worship. <laughs> in order for me to walk, I got to put the work in on this side because you're going you're to find yourself in a situation where you're weak. That's why you set up systems in weak areas. So when you're pressed in that weak area, you're able to say, I've been here before. See, that's why people talk about Toronto. They talk about the Raptors so much. They'll be like, you know what? They're a great team. They got a great bench, but they break down in playoff time. And people talk about Houston has a great team, but they have two players on a team who have fallen short in playoff time. Chris Paul, James Harden. <clears throat> it's something about being there before. Being there before. Being able to not pr crumble under pressure, but perform at a high level in pressure. That's why God puts us in pressure places so that we'll grow into, I know what this feels like, I've been here before. So that when I find myself in situations where the pressure wants me to compromise, I don't compromise because other people are watching. Man, that's why you got to have a great place to go to at home and a great council of people where you can vent to. Not everybody, <laughs> I 
Unfortunately, not everybody can handle what comes with your calling. If I said some of the things that scared me, if I was to put that kind of weight on a person that wasn't a three, the three boys that went with Jesus in the Mount Transfiguration was able to handle that transfiguration. Transfiguration means I'm showing you who I really am. You can't bring all 12 to the mountain of transfiguration because when you transform before them and you cry and this strong man and strong woman who've been carrying the call strongly before people cries at night. If people knew how many nights I cried and how many nights I wanted to quit, how many times I wanted to give up this thing, people would be like, well, you a weak man. You're right. <laughs> His strength is made perfect in my weaknesses. But his strength cannot be made perfect in my weaknesses if I am not willing to admit that I'm weak. A strong man or a strong woman are people who are able to admit that they're weak. But you don't admit that you're weak before everyone because not everybody's meant to come see you like you. See, when you preach, you look strong. You look powerful. You look like you've been walking this thing fervently since two. <laughs> you look, you look, you look like you. But 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 people don't understand when when the anointing subsides. When when you preach, the anointing at all time high. <clears throat> they say when a man or woman preaches, the 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 level of energy that goes out that person is equivalent to an eight hour work week. So one hour of preaching is eight hours. Eight hours. You know why it takes that much energy? Because the spirit is reverent you. The spirit is using you and the body without the grace of God is not capable to sustain that kind of anointing without the grace of God. So when you operate at that high level, when you, it's like two minutes after, insecurities come up. Was that good? Oh, um, um, oh, oh, I'm covering myself. Oh, it's Josh. Oh, oh, who took the king's clothes? Who took the coach's clothes? <laughs> you know, what happened to coach? Co because you don't execute at a high level that you didn't even know, you, you couldn't even get a word in because the Spirit was using you. That's why I don't follow these preachers because they're talented, but not anointed. Talented, gifted, but not anointed. Anointing is when you hear that message and you just pricked, like that thing just, even if it's a good loving message, <laughs> we talking about all wrath, but when it's love, you boo hoo oh God, you love me. <laughs> Oh, you love me. God. Yeah. Ugly cry. If you ain't ugly crying after a message, and if you ain't on your knees in repentance, it might not even be anointing. I'm not saying you be on your knees. We're talking about on the drive home. We're talking about on the bedside. We're talking about, we, we're not, because we, because we, this, this generation is too cool <laughs> to be slain. <laughs> no, <laughs> don't measure a person's public worship because when y'all get home, I know the Lord hits you. <laughs> when y'all get in the car, y'all pull the car over. Man, I should have told him that was a good message, but man, I'm so prideful. <laughs> I don't want, and the preacher be like, Did I, was it good, baby? You be going to your wife, baby, baby, was it good? Baby, it was good. You just saying that. You just, and people, people be lying to you. They be looking at you like, but when they get home, God. <laughs> anyway, next, the spirit realm is watching you. There's two people, there's two entities you cannot fool, the divine and the demonic. You can't fool them. You can't trick a demon. A demon has seen your kind before. So when you drift from the divine, you're susceptible to being devoured. <clears throat> what do lions do? They try to drift the weak cattle away from the flock. The first lion comes out, his job, actually it's the, the women, the ladies be out there. They be getting, they be bringing, they bring home the bacon. Anyway, what happens is that lion goes out first. That first lion's job is not to catch, the, the, is, to, is not to catch. Their job is to cause a disruption. So all of a sudden, every, it's hard it's, it's hard to walk worthy in panic mode. It's hard 
to walk worthy when you're caught off guard. But when you're poised and patient, when, pan when things are panicking around you, you got an inward peace. I love the scripture he says, what he says, I will give you a peace that will surpass all understanding. We want God to always give us the prize of our prayers, but we look down upon the peace that he gives us without the prize. So what happens is we get disappointed. <clears throat> it didn't come today. But God said, you know what's better than what you've been praying for? My peace. Because you know what my peace is letting you know? I heard. When I be in my prayer closet and, I, and I'm talking to God, I'm like, God, I'm a little nervous about this. Real talk, God, I'm a little nervous about this. Oh, that gentle peace, man. That peace that says, you know what, God? I don't know how you're going to fix this. <clears throat> and God never fixes things the way we want to be fixed. God don't need a manual on how to fix you. <laughs> he says, man, I do perfect surgery. I know how to cut you, open you, seal you back up, and remove the scar. I'm your ultimate surgeon. But them demons, they know what kind of walk you really have. How many, how many of our demons be laughing at us in church? <laughs> how many of them be laughing? They be like, oh, she cute. Look at her arms worshiping. Oh, she's true. They laugh. They laugh in the parking lot. They laugh. They leaned up against your car laughing. They know when you come out, you got me for six days. <laughs> One hour on Sunday can't defeat a devil you allow in your life for six days. These demons be like, you don't walk with God. You post, they post a line, they, they like your comments <laughs> through other people. They, they, they say, all I gotta do is slide a DM to him. All I gotta do is bring a tall six foot something, something dude around. And they know your walk. They know your walk because they observe you. And so what they do is, let's drift the weak from the flock. The second lion causes that other one to be drift alone. And there's a lion waiting in a bush over here that when you're running away from this one, this one gets you. Their strategy against you is so specific. You better walk with the lamb so that you won't be eaten by wolves. Because if you walk with the shepherd and you walk with the lamb of God, if you walk and you stay away him and you close, you don't have to worry about being snatched away. And it should be you. Take heed how you walk. The Bible says watch and pray lest you fall. Fall, you don't, you fall by walking into a trap. You should be observing you. Every week by Saturday, you should be examining how you walk that week. There should be one day in your week where you spend an hour or so auditing your previous week. Saturday, I do a Sunday, I do a Sunday afternoons when I'm meal prepping after that, that good deep worship around there. <clears throat> Sunday afternoon, sometimes Saturday, top afternoon I do it. I just say, who was I offended by? Who did I offend? Who could I walk better in love with? What could I have apologized for? How many days did I let go down before my wrath? I'm observing every category. God, what days do I usually find myself the weakest? Then on that Saturday, <clears throat> you're developing systems for that Friday. I know I'm my weakest Friday mornings. That's just natural because I preach. That's why most preachers take Monday off when they preach Sunday because you're empty, right? But unfortunately, slash fortunately to a degree, I have to go into a job right after Working eight hours, so Thursday I work 16 hour days of energy. So I know for Fridays, I gotta set better systems on Fridays to make sure in my weekday, my weekday, my weakest day, I don't fall. But if you never audit, your, if you never look back, if you never examine, you won't implement the systems to sustain you so that when you find yourself in there the next time, there should, your next week should never be beneath your last week. Your, you should always be going from glory to glory, even if it's a 1% increase. Because if you self-examine and you say, you know what? 
I know recently <clears throat> I do well Monday through Friday because I meal prep. Now I got to set up system on my weekends because I be eating a lot more carbs on weekends. So I'm not reaching my goals as quickly enough, but now I got to say, you know what? I need to be careful in overeating on these days. And knowing that, I set up systems. Your spiritual life, your emotional, mental, and physical. You got to audit your life and say, God, how am I walking? How did I walk this week? Take what you learn and then purposefully practice them the next week. Who should you walk for? You should walk for God, others, and yourself. You should walk for God. God, I'm walking for you. This 5K is for you. <laughs> this 5K is for everyone else. And this 5K is for me. <clears throat> Next verse, in a manner worthy. Real quick, we're gonna talk about the state of worthiness versus being worthwhile. State of worthiness versus being worthwhile. Point one, worthy, adoption versus assignment. This is important. Your state of worthiness is you're worthy as a son and daughter of God because you were chosen by him. You're worthy. You're worthy to be in my presence, God saying. You're worthy of my, my, my love. You're worthy of this relationship. You are worthy, worthy. Like, it don't matter. They said at 3 a.m., a prince or a princess can wake up the king. And God saying, you're my son and daughter. You can wake me up. You can talk to me anytime. I'm available. I'm easily accessible. If you need wisdom, he's a good father. He's a very good father. He is good. But not every son and daughter is good for the father. What I mean by that is, I'm adopted to the family. I'm adopted. I'm his son. You're his daughter. You adopted. But am I worthwhile to him? He's good to me, but am I of any use to him? I'm worthy. I'm his son and daughter, but let's be honest. <laughs> Every parent <coughs> has that one kid who they can trust more than the other one. It doesn't change the sonship or the daughtership. It doesn't change it. But that parent knows she ain't going to get it done. He ain't going to get it done. So they're in the family, but they're not useful. My goal is to be worthwhile to God. I'm worthy. I'm worth something to him. That, that when he looks at me, I'm gifted, I'm talented, I'm anointed, I'm consecrated, I'm ready, I'm willing, I'm able to go. There's a lot of people in this family who he loves equally. He, the able one, he doesn't love greater than the one that's not practicing the right ability now. Everyone's loved equally, but not everyone is used equally. I know for a fact that, that I can only, God can only use what I put in. That's it. That's quick math. <laughs> That's quick. That's easy math. That means if it's not in me, he can't use it. If I put it in me, he can use it. I'm worthy. I'm his son. But am I an heir? Like, am I a joint heir? Like, do it. <laughs> That's powerful. I'm a joint heir, joint heir, joint heir with Christ. I want to be so useful that when God needs something done, he looks my way. When God wants something done, does he look your way or look another way? I want when he sees me, he says, you know what? That's why, man, I used to, <clears throat> when they'd be calling a walkie-talkie, <laughs> they call for one person, they don't respond. And I'm like, man, dang. <laughs> Miss so-and-so. <laughs> Mr. so-and-so, you, they about to call me. I'm already up. Mr. Azzy, I don't want to bother. We done called you 50, 11 times. But when you're useful, there's a lot of burdens and a lot of weight that comes with someone that's useful. That's why I tell people, 
Don't get mad at the resistance. Don't get mad at the weight because God is saying the harvest is ripe, but at least you're a part of my labor few. There's a lot of work to get done. And God's saying, but numbers don't matter to me. God said, I wiped out 130,000 men with 300. God said, I don't need 30,000 members. I need 300 converts. That's all I need. God didn't say, I want the whole building. He said, I have a remnant. Is your following worthwhile to God? Is your following worthwhile to God? Is your worship worthwhile to God? Is your work worthwhile to God? Is your waiting worthwhile to God? And is your walk worthwhile to God? Number one, is your worship worthwhile? Is your work worthwhile? Is your waiting worthwhile? And is your walk worthwhile? Worship, work, waiting, walk. When God walks into your worship, is it a pleasant smell? or a non-pleasant smell. When he walks in, does he smell the onions? Does he smell the mildew? Does he smell the spoil? Stale worship? Spoiled worship? Or when he walks, does he smell a fragrance? Because he says he inhabits the praises of his people, inhabits. that This praise it's authentic. I'm going to inhabit it. Inhabit it means I'm living within this thing. It's electric. It's, I was going to, anyway, y'all knew where I was going. Boogie. Anyway, it's electric. And when I'm in that presence and God is inhabiting it, magic happens. Not even magic. Power, the divine happen. But when God see that worship, he says worship is, what he says, um, obedience is better than sacrifice. Saul Worship God, but his worship wasn't accepted by God. Cain worshiped God, but his worship wasn't accepted by God. When you offer your worship, he says it must be anchored in spirit and in truth. Sometimes when you worship, don't worship with the flesh. Worship from the depths of your soul. The depths of your soul means, God, I mean this thing. I don't care if it's when you're on your knees or you're running around the room, but don't run and be on your knees for no reason, for no purpose. Let it come from the depths of you, your work. He's saying, man, you giving me half done stuff. Is your work worthwhile? Well, God, I got, here, here's, the, here, here's my best. God saying, man, you, ain't, well, you didn't even do what it takes to give me your best. I want to, God, I want to give God the best of my work. Because I know for a fact if I work hard into the Lord, if I work for him and I give him something that he can, like God can't work something broke. Why are you handing me this broke wrench for? Why are you handing me this broke flashlight for? Why are you giving me a hammer with no hammer? Like why are you giving me this and that? I can't use it. But I'm going to start this ministry. God said I can't use that. God, here am I. I can't use you. Why God? Sin is in the midst. Is your waiting worthwhile to God? Your serving. Waiting. Man, God don't care about you. God don't care about your ability to wait. Because he forces you to wait. <laughs> he don't care about you. Oh, I waited, Father. He said, but how was your attitude while waiting? God measures the cheerfulness of us in situations where we don't really find welcoming. And I walk. That's easy to put. Of the calling you have been called, real quick, quick points, I'm out your way. It's pointless to answer the call if you're not going to apply or go after the call. I therefore, prison for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. It's pointless to answer the call if you are not going to apply or go after the call. God, I accept the call, but you're not even going after with fervency. And you're not even trying to apply. Number two. You are going to be held accountable for applying or avoiding the call. Whether you apply it or avoid it, you're going to be held accountable for it. 
You're going to be held accountable for applying or avoiding. Listen, listen. Stop making excuses. Well, I don't see myself worthy. I, stop making excuses. If he called you, he equipped you. Or he's equipping you. People are making these cute excuses so they can be like, you know what? God, I, I tried. You're going to be held accountable. Did you apply it? Or did you avoid it? Number three, your walk must match your calling. <clears throat> your walk must match your calling. If you have a global call, you got to walk like you got a global one. You got to move like you got a global one. You got to condition yourself for a global one. If you got, if you, well, no matter how big or small, a small calling from God is still a big calling. So don't be looking at somebody like, well, he got, he, God, you gave him regions. You just gave me my community. Now that's big. That's big. It's big. He says, I've dealt to every man a measure of faith. He says, man, listen, I don't care how small it may look upon you. It's big because every joint supplies that my maturity will help you mature. Your maturity will help me to mature. That I can't look at the elbow and be like, I don't need you, bro. No, you need everything. That's why, I, listen, I'll be praying over my spleen sometimes. God, how's my spleen doing? I'll be, on, I'll be on Google. How can I make sure my spleen and liver, I'll be getting the turmeric. I'll be doing everything because I'm like, I need my spleen. I don't want to be on dialysis and only have one kidney. I need both. I don't want half a lung. I want all my lungs. I want everything I came in. I want to die with everything that I came in this thing with. But you got to say, I got to be intentional about every area of me to make sure that my walk matches my calling. My final thoughts, are you doing these things with humility, gentleness, patience, love, and eagerness? The Bible reads, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain a unity in the spirit and the bond of peace. Are you doing these things with humility, gentleness, patience, love, and eagerness? I'll break this down next week. None of this is possible without the following molds. The Bible says there's one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, and one grace. You can't follow two bodies of people. You can't follow two spirits. You can't follow or lean on two hopes. You can't follow two lords. You can't live by, both, by two faiths. And you can't execute this thing with two graces. The Bible reads, I therefore, prison of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility, not pride, and gentleness, not sternness, with patience, not with impulsiveness, bearing with one another. I know it ain't easy. Everybody can't be loved, but you got to bear with one another in love. Eager, eager, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope. There's one hope. Oh, you can't hope in Christ and money. You can't hope. You got to hope in one that belongs to your call. There's a certain hope for your call. You can't hope in everything. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. <laughs> Old school. One God and Father of all. I could preach on that baptism. Boy, I wanted, I wanted to go deep in that baptism. One Father of all who was over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us <laughs> according to the measure of Christ's gift. My last point, last one, you will always match your molder. Who is molding you? Are you being more molded by wolves? Or are you being molded by the shepherd? It's all about what you accept. Please understand that God sees everything. And with that level of reverence, that reverence in God, a deep reverence for God, will spark the wisdom you need for your life. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for this message. <clears throat> I pray that when we walk out of here, our new walk will be worthy. We're in the family, God, but are we useful for the family's business? I pray, Father God, that we'll be eager to maintain, bold in our confidence in you, that we're able to do exceedingly above all than what you have for us. That we'll be able to execute, well, I'll mix that scripture up. Anyway, we'll execute at a high level. God, you said greater works. Could it be the reason why greater works is not working through us? Could it be because we're not walking worthy? 
I pray, Father, that we keep up step with you because we're walking beside you. Oh, how beautiful the journey will be. We thank you for this time, God. We love you. In your name we do pray. Amen. For those watching online, <clears throat> watching wherever we want to say thank God so much for watching. Feel free to share the broadcast. Get out to meet these people. Make sure you get the worksheet because there's an exercise before you cl close the videos. This week, exercise is called, Is It Worth His While? Is it worth his while? Take some time this week to write down in the first row the current state of your worship, work, waiting, and walk. And on the next row, write down what you would need to do to improve in those areas. I want you to look at your current state of your worship, the current state of your work, the current state of your waiting, the current state of your walk. After that, I want you to look and be like, real talk, I ain't walking worthy in these areas. Or if I am, how can I utilize the energy from that area to implement the systems in the other areas. I love you guys. Description box below. Please comment. I would love to see what you got to say. If you want to give, get involved. Get me out to your city. Get going in the description box. I love you guys. Be blessed.